It's really good to be with you again. Uh, so much has happened since the last week when I came to be with you, and I'll share with you a little bit more. Um, what I intend to do is to continue the series on um, what we are learning about God as our sender, meaning God is a missionary God, and that God loves and cares for all humanity, and transit that into an application this Sunday in talking about God as our healer. Okay? So I want to recap a little bit on what we did last Sunday. So last Sunday, we talked about God's unquenchable commitment towards the nations. And in the unquenchable commitment of God towards the nation, He has called the whole church to become a missional church, to be a church that learns how to grow in our knowledge of God, that song that we just sang, that Justin just led us, is a great song that speaks about God being a way maker. What is a way maker? A way maker is a situation whereby you're totally blocked. And it's God's intent for you to walk in a certain direction, but it's totally blocked and God creates a way. There's an old song that says God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I think many of us, we are familiar with that song. I want to tell you a story. You know, we, we, we house uh, people from the streets in YWAM, not as a ministry, but in this case, it was a very, very special case because this man, who was a homeless man, he had an encounter with Jesus, both in a dream as well as Jesus in flesh, standing in front of him. This is opposite, Golden Landmark, uh, opposite Raffles Hospital at a former Golden Landmark Hotel, now called Village Hotel. He sleeps under the bridge. He had a vision of Jesus coming to him, calling to him in his name, and asking him to become a disciple and follower of Christ. And then after that, he had a physical visitation of Jesus that came to him. As a result, he was brought to us in YWAM, where I had the privilege of doing Bible study with him in his language, using the Bible in his language, leading him towards his baptism that was held at St. Andrew's Cathedral. And this man was slated to actually die. The doctor says that he's at his final stage, his organs are failing, he's supposed to die. But he came and lived with us in YWAM, and we kind of like helped him with his diet, and he didn't die. Instead, he lived on. He lived on for a little while more, and for all this while, we have always known him as a homeless man with no family members. And six months after into his conversion, he came and he said to me, I actually have a wife and two children. And I've been praying that God will make a way. So every time when he's with us, he will sing the song, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And the other song that he loves to sing is the Hide Me Now. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storms. And, 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 and he will be closing his eyes, humming these two songs, and as if that he could see Jesus in front of him. And in the midst of that, while he was doing this, one day he said to me that I actually have a wife and my two kids and I really want to tell them about who Jesus is, but they live in another country. One day out of the blue, the wife called him. Now the wife comes from a faith whereby they are not open to receive the Lord into their lives. And then the wife called him and the wife, he was so shocked because he has not spoken to his wife for more than a decade. The wife called him and he then told his wife that I need to tell you that I'm right now a follower of Christ. I have done so many bad things towards you and our children and I'm so sorry. I just want you to know that I'm sorry. I'm now baptized and I'm now a follower of Jesus. The wife on the, on the phone on the other hand said this, the reason why I call you is because I just became a follower of Jesus. And I need your permission so that I can get baptized. And he was so shocked. He was so shocked that God preserved his life to see this thing happen. There was a, an element of the healing of God in his life for a purpose. It's for him to find out this truth that his wife too has come to faith. And then he arranged to meet with his wife. So they arranged to meet in a certain place, in a certain country, and as he was there waiting for her, the wife, the daughter, and the lady that led the wife to Christ drove up to meet him, and all three met a car accident, and all three died in a car crash. He was so heartbroken. He came back. We asked him to come back to us. He came back to us, and this time now, he's humming the tune, God will make a way, and when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will be still and know that you are God. 
And I see Hamza's song with tears in his eyes. And I could see that this man have somewhat grappled the, the, the heart of God. And he actually said this, God healed me enough for me to know that my wife and my children have come to faith. And after all, if I were to die first and they die later, when they go back, they might get killed for whatever reasons that they, they go through. At least now, she goes first. And I'm joining her in a while's time. And then we can get married in heaven again. I got no heart to tell him, say there's no marriage in heaven. But, but he said, that he was looking forward to that. So I, I saw something. I saw that God, in performing his act of miracle, the way maker, the healing, uh, the healer, the miracle worker, he did this work in this man so that this man could live to see the salvation of his wife, could live to see the un un unification of eternal healing that God will come and bring about in that. This story is both capturing the pain of humanity and yet the joy of eternity. And that's what God wants us to learn in our walk with Him. Is that in this, in this quest, in this desire to want to know God and to make Him known in that manner, that the church will learn how to walk in a missional way to really understand God in the totality of who He is and not to confine God to my well-being. What we must never do is to enter Christianity with a pagan mindset. What is to enter Christianity with a pagan mindset? To enter Christianity with a pagan mindset is to have me as a centre of everything. Meaning, my well-being, my comfort, my success, my prosperity is the centre of my faith. If you do that, then you are wearing a pagan hat sitting in a church. And that's not where God wants us to be. He invites us into a relationship whereby we don't recognise Jesus as my saviour, but we recognise Him as our Lord. As our Lord, that we are His servants, we are His followers, and we live our lives to yield unto Him that the centre of well-being is not me, but it's who God is, and that I am absorbed into the bigger picture whereby all that happens to me in my life is for a general purpose that God gets the greatest honour and glory out of my life. And that so it speaks about God's longing. Here is a scripture that I shared with us this, uh, last week, that God longs to be revealed and God is a proactive God that will take everything possible to make it known to us. So I said this, God will take the 999 steps and leave that one step to you. But you and I need to understand that one step is a matter of life and death for many of us. That one step it's a matter of the consequences that will come about. If we choose to make that step, something great will happen. If we choose not to make that step, if we choose to choose otherwise, then consequences will follow. And God's loving kindness, no matter how wonderful and how great God is, He will never override our choices because God highly respects the sovereign choice that He has given to all humanity. Why? Because He has made man in His image. To be made in the image of God, one of the aspects is to be made with the sovereign choice of the individual. And here is God saying this, I made you in my image. I've given you the authority to choose. Therefore, choose wisely. Therefore, choose wisely. Choose how you will live your life. Choose how you will relate to my commands, to my instructions. So God created for us a biblical manual on how to live life. So he says this, this is my presentation to you and this is my 999 to you. you got to choose whether you want to live by this. If you choose to live by this, you will, ex you will experience life according to what this book says. But if you choose not to, you will face whatever consequences that you have chosen because God made us in His image. And so therefore, we talk about the, the gospel being a one that takes hold of the Word of God and making it real and live in our community so that we reveal to the people surrounding us. Therefore, God sends us out. He sends us out to reveal Him. He sends us out to showcase who He is. And in that process, that God wants us to learn to respond to Him. Now, last week, 
I make an order call, and many of you stood up. I went back and I thought about it, and this is what I wrote here that I thought I want to guide you in this process. To those who responded to be available for one month, three months, six months, or one year of attachment to the field, this is what I want to encourage you to do. Number one, to be continually prayerful and alert, God will show signs along the path. This is not something that you are to orchestrate it and make it happen because if God, God is the one that's very committed to this piece of work and He will make clear to you what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to enter. And number two is to be obedient to the small missional assignments ahead of you. Make room for inconvenience. It is important that before we embark into the 1361, that we learn to cultivate obedience in bite-sized things, bite-sized assignments. If we cannot be obedient to the small little things, how can we be entrusted with bigger things, right? So therefore, here is the journey and the process of discipleship that God is calling us into. And number three, when Pastor Anthony called you to meet, don't be scared. (laughs) <laughs> there is a journey of wanting to walk with us into this journey of obedience. Coming to that whatever meeting that he might call may or may not, it's not a commitment. It's just to listen in and listen to the guidance that the church will give to you with regards to this discipleship. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about Jehovah Rapha, meaning the God who heals, our God who heals. And there's a scripture here that I know is not a common scripture that people use for healing, but it's a very powerful scripture if you were to learn and understand it. Okay, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 2. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing trees. 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. Now, this scripture is about the eternal heaven. It's about the place where God will call us to be. If you were to look at the scripture, it says this, the trees, the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, if you are a Chinese sensei, you will say, wow, this is very biblical. Leh. Chinese medicine is all about herbs. If you are an eye herb, a nutritionist, you will love it because this is all about that. If you are a tea lover, well, lucky better because this is what the scripture is saying. So there are elements of truth in some ways that the leaves of the tree it's for the healings of the nations, if you take it literally where it stands for. And that's why part of our diet, we have to eat leaves. Why? Because it is, there is a healing component. In all that God has made, is a healing component in there. So this is where that scripture comes from. But there is another flip side of looking at this scripture. That is to remember John 15. John 15 says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. What is on the branches? Leaves. Leaves. I am the vine and you all are the branches. But what is on the branches? Leaves and fruits. So when this word says, these are the leaves of the tree that is meant for healing of the nations, he's talking about us. We are God's agent of healings for the nations. We are God's agents to bring healing to the nations of the world. So what do you mean by healings of the nations of the world? I bring you back to this. Because this is where we express God's healing. Healing in the industry of education. Healing in the work of family. Healing in the work of business. The redemption gift of God in science and technology. The redemption gift of God in journalism and writing and communications and media. The the redemptive love of God towards the government sector and towards the arts entertainment. Even more so, the arts entertainment. God desires to bring healing in every one of this sector that through our agents of work, God will reveal His healing through us. 
those of you who are in the education sector. God desires that through your educational work, you bring healing both to the systems and to the lives of the children that God has entrusted to your care. Those who are, of you who are in the business realm, God desires to bring healing to your employees and to the customers that He will bring to your path if you were recognised and learn to walk with Him in that way. So that's where God talks about when He talks about the Jehovah Rapha. But where does this the word Jehovah Rapha, meaning the Lord who heals, comes from? It came from Exodus. It is a story about uh, bitter water. The water was bitter, and the people were grumbling and complaining towards Moses. So God spoke to Moses to take a piece of wood and throw it into the water, and the water became sweet. But what I want you to pay attention to is verse 26. What it says there, he said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptian, for I am the Lord your God who heals you. In this passage, there are two things you must pay attention. One is if. If. There is a condition. There is a condition to the healing of God. That is the word called if. And then the second part of this verse, it says, I will. The Lord is your healer. I will. I am the Lord who heals you. So here is God making that commitment. Do one part, I will do the other part. And God is someone that, that actually commits himself to all of us. So in God's purpose, in God's desire... He says that, can I have my papa? In God's desire, in God's perspective, healing is both prevention and cure. Prevention and cure. The if component is preventive. The cure component is the I am. I will heal you. But here, it reveals two aspects of God's character. I'm showing you how to look at the situation and look, reflect back into the character of God. He's both merciful and just. So, he has instructed us the preventive measures to enjoy good health. If we do not abide by the preventive measures that God has given to us, God is just to allow us to face the consequences of our choices. But when we choose to respond, God is merciful to bring healing and restoration. Capture this thing in the essence of the character of God the mercy and the justice of God. God will always prefer to show mercy. Between mercy and justice, God will always want to show His mercy because God is a God that has mercy. His mercy never ends. We sing about it all the time. His mercies never come to an end. However, if mercy, if God's showing mercy to us does not bring change to us, he has no hesitation to show us the hand of justice. Do you see that? If mercy does not bring us into a place of restoration, but instead His mercy is causing you to run further and further away and into self-destruction, then the hand of God has no hesitation to show you His hand of justice. But the reason why He shows you the hand of justice is not to punish you. It's not to punish you. It's so that you may turn and come back. The moment when you turn, you will find that mercy is right there waiting for you. That is the immense headset of God, the loving kindness of God, whereby God so longs to show His loving kindness to us, but when His loving kindness does not work, on our hearts because we take things for granted and we live a life constant self-destruction, then God has no problem in withholding that and let justice flow on into your life. But when He does that, He does it so that you may turn. Then the moment when you turn, you will find that God will run to you and wrap His arms around you and bring you back into the place of restoration. So, God wants to heal. He can and He loves to see restoration and wholeness. Healing, however, to God is only symptomatic. God wants to always deal with the root of the sickness. 
In God's hand, He doesn't just want to deal with the symptoms of healing, but God always wants to go into the depth because God's restoration and a new creation, by the way, God doesn't do renovation. He tears down and He rebuilds brand new. That is the nature of God. And so when God does a work, He wants to do it thoroughly into our lives. He wants to bring full restoration to us. So God's ministry of healing is always multidimensional. It is physical, it is emotional, it is mental, it is relational, it is social and it's spiritual. The healing is seen whenever the consequences of poor choices, both personal and corporate, are overcome with repentance and God's original intent is restored. God not only wants to heal the individual persons, but God wants to heal the corporate body. It's always dual level. God loves you, but God loves the whole. God loves the individual, but God loves the world as well. So therefore, healing component is never just about me. It's always tied to a bigger body, a bigger picture, a bigger story that beyond me. So, so God's longing and God's desire is to bring us into the place whereby our physical healing is directly tied to an emotional one, directly tied to a relational one, directly tied to a social one, directly tied to a spiritual one. That physical healing is only a symptom. God always wants to deal with the root problem. So when we look into scriptures, here are all the stories of the healings in the gospel. Well, now when you read through one at a time, when you look through that, you will find that it falls into four categories. This is just the first slide. The second slide that's going to do with the healing of the gospel is this one. And all these are talking about how Jesus went about to bring healing to people. Now you will find that in where you capture all of it, it consists of children, women, young people, old people of all generations and of different race. So here, the healing of God has got to do with all ages. So those of us who are a little bit older, please do not say, I, uh, I already don't trouble God. No, why like that? It's not meant to be. It's meant to be for all ages. From babies all the way through to older senior people, God wants to heal. But God wants to heal for a bigger purpose. God doesn't just want to heal you just so that you can live a little bit longer. No, God wants to heal you because God wants your life to end well. To end well for a greater purpose that's not just your well-being but for a greater intention there. So the reasons why Jesus healed, this is very important. The reasons why Jesus healed, they're all together four reasons here. Number one, is to point people to God. It's to point people to God and to bring glory to Him. You must understand, every miracle in the Gospel of John is an arrow. It's an arrow. Every time when Jesus heals someone, it's an arrow. That act of healing is an arrow and the arrow points. It points. It points people to God. It points people to give glory to Him. The second reason, it says that it's to free people from bondages and evil. And thirdly, it's to free people from the effects of sin. So bondages and evil. You know, all of us sometimes in our own wayward, wayward behaviour, we all have done certain things here and there. One time when I, I told you that I, I, I was raised in an Anglican church, I became a Christian in an Anglican church. And in our Anglican church, we have our liturgy. So we stand to sing, sit to listen, kneel to pray. It's a very common practice within the Anglican church. And my church is an Anglican church whereby we wear robes and we have got colours, we have got all the stuff, we have our liturgy every Sunday and everything. But this Anglican church is also very spirit-filled. So it has the combination of traditional and moving by the power of the Spirit, all contained together in a very beautiful manner. So Canon James Wong, I remember going to church Sunday after Sunday, in at least in the first three to four years of my Christian faith, every Sunday I see healing. It was every Sunday. I've seen the blind heal, the lame walk. I've seen people that were demon-possessed delivered out of that. So I grew up with the diet of recognizing that if I were to believe in God, then God will demonstrate His power in the forms of signs and wonders. So as a youth at that point in time, I will follow my pastor and going around to pray for people. So one time as a youth, I went into someone's house and this person has been so depressed for such a long time and haven't been able to put on weight and is losing weight and that depression is just causing her to have a lot of suicidal thoughts. Now this lady has a lot of more. 
uh, what is mo ki? Is it ki? Zi. We we call it zi. Mo. He has a lot of mo on 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 the body. And I was and and the pastor was praying, 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 praying. Nothing works. As we were about to leave, I saw a mo on the neck. I know that mo is in the midst of how many moles there are in the whole body. And the Lord spoke to me. That mo came about because she asked someone to do something on her and that person put a dot onto the neck. So I scared lah. I'm a young person, what? But because I grew up in the diet, recognizing that if God is revealing something to you, at least try lah. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I mean, we tried so many things already. It didn't work. So at least try lah. Wrong, wrong lah. So I whispered to my pastor. My pastor said, "We try everything already. Just try, just try." <laughs> so I did lah. I shared with auntie. I said, "Auntie, have you ever asked someone to do something on you and the person put a black dot onto your neck?" She stared at me. She said. How you know? I said, I don't know. God, God knows. So we prayed for her. From that point onwards, everything was broken. God set her free. There is a place whereby sometimes in our weaknesses, in our human error, we did something that we're not supposed to. And that invited the entrance of the oppression and entrance of something that is not of the ordinary and it begins to bring oppression into our lives and God wants to set us free. But in order to set us free, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit and go back to the source. Remember the root of the problem? God wants us to deal with the source and when we deal with the source, the person is set, set free. So the point about healing is not to pray about the part about depression but it's to ask the Lord, Lord, where is the root of this issue so that we can deal with the root so that the symptoms of sickness and all of this physical ailment is being resolved as a result of that. And fourthly, is to free people from physical ailment, from physical problem, from physical impairment. There is a place where God wants to bring healing to the blind, God wants to bring healing to the lame, and God wants to bring healing in all of the physical issues that we all go through. So all the healings and restorations are for the primary purpose of restoring, deepening relationships with God and He and be a witness of all that God has done. I want to move on to the next thing that's called emotional health. So, I said to us just now that the physical healing is directly tied to the emotional situation. Here is a write-up uh, that I learned in the process of my, of my studies right now. It says that positive emotions leads to po emotional resilience. Positive emotions have a scientific purpose. is to help the body recover from the ill effects of persistent and negative emotions. Cultivating positivity over time can help us become more resilient in the face of crisis or stress. Emotional resilience is like a rubber band. No matter how far a resilient person is stretched or pulled by negative emotions, he or she has the ability to bounce back to his or her original status. There are altogether six negative emotions that impact our physical health. Number one is anger, fear, sad, shame, disgust, and hopeless despair. All these six emotions rooted in a circumstance or a situation if we were to allow it to brew in our hearts and constantly swim around that, our minds and our emotions constantly swing around that, it will have a physical effect on our bodies. All doctors will tell you that. Right? It will have a physical effect on our bodies. And it says here, negative attitudes and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness can create chronic stress, which upsets the body hormone balance, depletes the brain chemicals required for happiness and damages the immune system. Repressed emotions, especially fearful and negative ones, can zap mental energy, negatively affect the body and lead to health problems. Chronic stress can decrease our life span. Your brain is hardwired to feel negative emotions. Negative emotions travel faster along your neural pathway than positive ones do. This was God's design. God has designed us to have negative emotions as part of our well-being so that we will survive in a broken world. The longer we stay in a negative emotion, the harder it is that it will be on us. 
Between last week and this week, my dad was hospitalized. Hospitalized with the advanced stage of uh, prostate cancer. And it took all of us by surprise because he was walking and eating. And all of a sudden, he went to an A&E whereby we now have to make some very, very difficult decisions. And as I'm preparing for this sermon today, this week, it was extremely, extremely difficult for me to have to preach to you a message of healing and yet believing in my heart on how God designs and desire to bring fullness to my dad's life. He's 91 years old. Now, I'm not saying that 91 years old means that you deserve to. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that there is a journey whereby one experiences that what he has, he's now a believer. What he walks through the whole process of things. And how do you deal with some of this kind of pain situation? And how do you go about carrying something? It's not over for me yet. We are still in the midst of this whole journey of having to do this. And I'm very, very aware of these negative emotions, both in my dad, in me, in all of my family members. And I'm very aware of the impact of these negative emotions will have on us physically, on me physically, as I go about in my daily work and being at a hospital every day and yet attending to issues about missions, issues about faith, issues about everything that's in there and having to prepare this Sunday sermon. And so, so it is to learn how to carry all of these emotions and learn how to distill it before God and to say that I know that God is still in charge. And in this process of learning how to walk alongside with all of these negative emotions that's going through and to watch how my body is responding, gosh, I, I, this, I get a first-hand experience of experiencing how my body reacts to the thought and the processes of all that's going on within this whole week. And I'm very conscious of everything that's going on around me. Hence, therefore, as I begin to rest and rely on God and just learn how to be, be still in the presence of God, I learn how to dive into who God is and trusting in His process and guiding us through as a family onto how to help my dad in this process. Or whether is it to continue to believe God that God is going to do something wonderful out of it which is going to be a huge, huge miracle or God is going to do something else that's even greater out of this whole story and out of this whole situation. So, what does the Bible say about emotional health? Watch this, the scriptures. Let's read this together, okay? Uh, Proverbs 17, ready, go. A joyful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Many people who are into healing and everything would point this to arthritis. Bitterness dries up your bones. And I don't think that's not confounded. I think there is some biblical basis towards this. Next scripture, Proverbs 14.30. Ready? Go. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Wow. <laughs> like all of us, we can. <laughs> envy rots the bones. Wow. Next scripture. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Next one. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Woo! He's saying that everything that's inside of you is the well-being of everything that's going to happen within your life. So how does God bring healing to our emotions that eventually leads us to experience physical healing? Now tell me, what do you see? Do you see a tunnel or do you see a pyramid? One of the first things that God does in bringing healing to all of us is perspective. Is perspective. When God is able to change our perspective towards this current situation, He changes the way we approach it. And the primary issue here that God deals with when it comes to healing is always how you see Him and how you look at this situation. 
And that perspective is so important because it will determine the choices that you will make in life. So there are three things that God will do in terms of dealing with our emotional pain. Dealing with our emotional pain that leads to physical sicknesses. First is this word called joy. Joy. One of the things that God loves to do is joy, is to ignite joy in our hearts. This morning, Justin leads us in a song called Rejoice, the Lord is King. His introduction, I was like, whoa, what kind of song is this? And then it's a hymn. Wow, I've never heard a hymn played in such a way manner before. And, and, and this word joy is so real. Why? Because in the ironic blessing in Numbers chapter 6, when it says, the Lord bless you, the Lord turn His face towards you. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? The Lord turned His face towards you. It means this. God looks at us and He says, It's so good to see you, Audrey. I know you tried to hide behind the mask. It's so good to see you. And this is what God does. When He looks at us, He says, It is so good to see you. As some of you did with me this morning, it's so good to see you. And that's how God relates to us. Now, why is that so? Because when you have a baby... One of the things, anyone here has gone to a baby and show an ugly face? <laughs> Never lah. We all look at the baby and we will smile at the baby. And when the baby sees you smile, what does the baby do? Smiles back. Why? Because joy triggers an electron light in our brain, our right brain. It triggers that, that joy element and it responds to joy and immediately that brings health to our bodies. Joy brings health to your body. Scripture says, a cheerful heart is a good medicine. That's why now you've got laughing therapy. Okay, I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm saying this, joy is such an important thing that he ignites the heart of God. Number two is gratitude. Thanksgiving, so many times in scriptures, it reminds us to give thanks to God and to remember all that God has done. And when you count the blessings of God in your lives, when you count what God has done in your lives, it will immediately change how you respond to Him. Number three is forgiveness. Joy, gratitude, and forgiveness. God wants us to learn how to forgive people, especially those who have offended us and in the midst of the offence, it causes us to have bitterness, that causes us to have the physical problem. So, I want to introduce this new term to all of us. <laughs> it's called emotional constipation. Most of us here, we are emotionally constipated. We take in our experience one thing that we don't like, or is painful, and we think that if we were to ignore it, it will go away. Right? We all do that. Ignore it. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it and then it might just go away. Actually, it does not. Nothing we experience just goes away. It is trapped in the system and it must be processed or dealt with or it will cause many messy problems, especially manifested in our bodies. If we were to neglect the pain, it compacts and it hardens us, it clogs us the emotional system, then we cannot deal with other things effectively. The emotional system, which is meant to extract life, from life experiences, gets blocked. And soon, we can't feel anything because we are plugged up, we are, we are clocked up. Our emotions become confused, distorted, and we quickly act out of proportion. To deal with things, we must look honestly at the emotions involved with the values and the beliefs attached to them. We need to see where the problem is, what it says about us, and bring God into the picture to clean up the mess by us not dealing with it. It requires humility and honesty about what is really going on. Forgive the person or forgive yourself. Communicate with whomever you need to talk with and get it out of our system. Your bodies will respond to your emotional health. And this is an area that I feel that most of us here, we are trapped because we are told that tears and crying is weakness. I notice my time is coming out. I want to close soon. You know, tears and crying. I want to say this to you. It is the first language that God gave to all humanity. No babies born talking. All the babies born trying to communicate and they communicate by crying. And only mothers 
have the capacity to identify the cries of the baby. Fathers, we a bit blow on. The baby cry, oh, the mother know that the baby is hungry, you know. The mother know that the baby is having uh, stomach pain uh, or, or diaper rash uh, or, or, or any of this kind of situation. And fathers, we, we, we can't tell, but the mothers can tell. Why? Because sometimes uh, one drop of tear, wow, it's like one paragraph. Eh? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know the camera, when they do movie, uh, they like to zoom into someone's eye, then you see one drop, then slow-mo the whole thing. Why? Because tears is a language. Tears is a language that bypasses the left brain and it's a language of the heart. But you know what we do with it? We shut it. We are trained to shut up our tear ducts because it depletes weakness. Not to God. Not to God. And so in God, Psalms 56 verse 8, He says this, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Some of us, our bottle in heaven is empty. Some of us are, wow, well, not enough. We need to one container. <laughs> but tears is a form of communication. So as we look into the three steps of healing, Scriptures has this mystery that we are safe, we are being saved and we shall be saved. Same for healing. We are healed, we are being healed, and we shall be healed. Because healing is at many, many different levels and it leads me to close with this eternal healing. There is a place whereby we are healed for eternity. Meaning, you, might, you and I must remember, our life on earth uh, is a dot in this line that doesn't stop. Eternity. So, 80, 90 years on earth is nothing compared to eternity. When you live life thinking that your dot, meaning your 90 years on earth or 100 years on earth, is it, then you will invest everything into that. But if you were to understand that your life and my life is for eternity, then healing into eternity is a miracle. It's a miracle of God. And Paul says, it's better for me to live and to be with Jesus than to be here on earth. Because why? that's where we want to be. So Christians, we are not afraid to pass on. In fact, we pass on into eternity with celebration and joy. And that's one thing that we all have as children of God and as believers of Christ is that we can venture into eternity with a great sense of joy. So, in closing... In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says that the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus. I close with C.S. Lewis' statement. Mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain. Isn't it? Mental pain, less dramatic than physical pain. But it is more common and is harder to carry. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It's easier to say, my tooth is aching than to say, my heart is broken. And God is someone that says, when you stand before me, be real. Don't hide. Be real. So in closing, I have this invitation that you will enter into rest and restoration this morning that you will come to Jesus and you will come to Him and He says, and I will give you rest. This word rest is complete restoration. And that's what God desires. This morning as I share with you, I could tell that many of you here, some parts of this morning really hit you hard. And I want to encourage you not to ignore it and not to move it away. I'm going to ask Pastor Anthony to come up. Maybe the musicians may want to come up.